Welcome to More Than an Asterix, Invisibility, Pretendians, and Reclaiming Indigenous Narratives. I'm Liz Montegari. I teach in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department here, and I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Dr. Nicole Prescott, uh, well, welcoming you back to Stony Brook University. Uh, I will turn things over to Dr. Prescott momentarily, but I'd like to begin by thanking the co-sponsors for tonight's event. Uh, Dr. Prescott's talk is a part of the College of Arts and Sciences Sir Run Run Shaw Lecture Series. In 1985, Sir Run Run Shaw, a philanthropist and entertainment mogul, made a donation to the college that helped establish one of the Stony Brook Foundation's earliest endowments. The, this endowment, uh, the proceeds from that endowment, continue today to fund exciting lecture series. Uh, uh, like today's event. This event is also supported by the History Department, uh, the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department, and the newly forming Native American and Indigenous Studies Program. Uh, a shout out to Chris Scarpati for coordinating Dr. Prescott's itinerary, and of course a huge thanks to Jackie Donnelly for performing all of the logistical magic behind the scenes. So Dr. Nicole Prescott is Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs for one of the largest university systems in the US, the University of Texas system. She holds a PhD in history and a graduate certificate in women's gender and sexuality studies from Stony Brook University. Ooh, again. You're a real crowd pleaser. Um, an MA in women's studies from Miami University and a BA in history from UT Austin. In her current role, Dr. Prescott is responsible for leading student success initiatives across the entire UT system. Her work not only advances equality and inclusion, specifically in higher education, but also addresses the student success continuum from preschool through graduate school with a special focus on data, policy, and strategic partnerships. She currently serves on the executive committee of the Miami University Foundation Board, is a member of the governing council of the National Institute for Native Leadership in Higher Education, and in her free time, I guess, consults for the Aspen Institute on Rural Tribal Community Post-Secondary Pathways. Dr. Prescott is a citizen of the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and actively participates in the culture and language revitalization efforts of her people. She formerly served on the board of directors of the American Indians of Texas and as the executive director of the Miami Foundation. She is also a member of the National Congress of American Indians, the National Indian Education Association, and the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. In addition to publishing her research in scholarly journals, Dr. Prescott writes for popular publications, including the American Indian Graduate and Miami Miami tribal newspapers, and has been interviewed by local and national media outlets, including NPR, Univision, and Indian Country Today. In Austin, she serves and has served on numerous equity-focused committees, including the Mayor's Task Force on Institutional Racism and Systemic Inequities, the Bilingual Innovation Design Team as part of Austin Independent School District, and the Austin College Access Network. I got carried away writing this because I'm just blown away by what you're doing. <laughs> so, given everything that you are always already doing, I feel especially grateful that you have made time to come and visit us this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Prescott will teach, will teach, well, yeah, you'll be teaching okay. for about 40 to 45 minutes, and we will have ample time for question and conversation. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nicole Prescott. Thank you, thank you. I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathering here today on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what now is called North America. Stony Brook University resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the ter territory of the Sitalkit Nation. The Sitalkits and the additional 12 indigenous communities who once lived or continue to live in the broader Long Island region have endured the experiences of removal, forced migrations, assimilation, and frequent invisibility. I joined Stony Brook University in affirming indigenous sovereignty, history, and experience. I want to thank the Sitalkits for allowing me to visit their homelands, and I especially want to um, acknowledge that we have some visiting dignitaries here today from the Unkachag um, uh, tribe, uh, Chief Wallace and his wife, and I would just want to say Kikwe Situle 
Thank you, I show my respect to you. Aya cheke ewe makeke, ne we da wens wiane, miamia tawenge, ne ko wens wiane, akala shamat tawenge, nila miamia, eakwa misiane kati nahi mitosenia. Hello, all my relatives. Neweta is my traditional name, which means she speaks. Nicole is my English name. I'm a proud citizen of the Miami Nation of Oklahoma, and I strive to live as a proper human. Um, I put this up here because um, I think it's really important for, your, for me to share with you who I am, where I come from. So um, as, as most indigenous people do, we will tell you a little bit about our family and our lineage and our ancestors. So here is my current family. This is me and my lovely wife, Sarah, and my family with my, um, me and my wife, I'm the short one, and our two kids um, who ended up being much better lacrosse players than, than myself. And uh, this, is, oh, this is my mother, my father, and one of our close family friends, and that's my sister, my nephew, and my cousin, and myself in um, regalia after a naming ceremony. And I want to just show you this. This is um, every year when we go to tribal gathering for our summer uh, gathering, uh, where we have our general council, we have a huge lacrosse game, and it's a, it's a community lacrosse game. And so we've got people out there who are 70 years old, and we've got people out there who are like three years old, and then we've got a lot of you know, younger folks in the middle who you know, have to sometimes jump over the tinies. Um, and we just play this ginormous community lacrosse game, and it really, we're using our language in the lacrosse game. Um, we don't have a whole lot of rules. And we are also <laughs> playing with our traditional sticks. So, um, and I just have to throw it out there, I have gotten a black eye and a busted lip from playing, and I still play every year. So, it's pretty amazing. I wanted to let you know, too, that I am related to um, two great Miamia Akemake, which means chiefs. Uh, Misha Kanakwa, otherwise known as Little Turtle, which many people have heard of. Uh, his name is actually Big Turtle. Misha Kanakwa means Big Turtle, but his dad was also Big Turtle. So um, the English folks decided to call him Little Turtle, and that's the name that stuck. Um, the one over here on the left is Pakan, um, and we still use him as a, um, a, a, a family name. And they were both uh, chiefs. Uh, Pakan was a war chief. Mishikanakwa was actually a war chief and a civil chief, which was not very usual to have the same person being uh, the same kind, the, the, both of those kinds of chiefs. So um, this also, I'm also descended from Takamwa. Uh, this is not an image of Takamwa. The other were actual, uh, supposedly, um, sketches of those two chiefs. But um, of course, being a woman, no one thought to sketch her uh, or record who she was. But we do have a lot of great information from a, a very fiery uh, divorce proceeding that happened. And I love reading it. She, she divorced a, a French uh, trader. And she was a diplomat, which is highly unusual. She was a cultural mediator. She was a, 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 a Miao Mia leader, and she was also a very um, astute businesswoman. So um, when I was born, my mother had named me Takamwa, and then later on, as often happens, I was given um, a, a different name. So. Um, she was the sister of the two gentlemen I just showed you pictures of. So they were half siblings kind of all the way around. My lineage has experienced two forced removals before settling in northeastern Oklahoma where I was born. And my mother, Pitala Nuhkwa, meaning rain woman, was a respected elder in the tribe before she walked on many years ago. Um, but she did move back to our um, removal homelands of Oklahoma for her last 15 years of life. I also just want to say, too, that um, I welcome any questions or comments uh, throughout my presentation. Don't wait until the end. Feel free to raise your hand or, or whatever. Love to take your questions throughout. Can I ask you, you being one who lived in Texas before she went back to 
She did, yes, that is where I grew up, um, but we, she definitely got back to Oklahoma as soon as she could to be back with our, our tribal community. But we always went back um, for summer things, and you know, we now do a winter stomp and winter gathering as well. But. So uh, the Meow Meow first emerged as a distinct people along the banks of the St. Joseph River near South Bend, Indiana. We call our homelands Miamionge, which means the place of the Miami. And today we consider Miamionge as along the Wabash River in Indiana. You can kind of see it up there, and I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna narrate you through what that, that map is about here in a second. But we've got the Wabash area um, as our original heartland area, and then the Merida Scene River in Kansas, and the Neosho River in Oklahoma, which reflects our removal history. So as I mentioned, our history does um, um, consist of two forced removals. We originally started up here in around Peru and Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne was actually our largest village, and it was called Kikionga uh, until Mad Anthony Wayne completely raised the village and erected a fort, and so then it became Fort Wayne. Um, we were forcibly removed at gunpoint in 1846. We were put on um, flat boats, taken all the way down here, and then uh, put on river boats and made our way all the way over here to the Kansas Landing, and we walked overland to our reservation in Kansas. Um, about 30 years later after that, um, there was a little thing called Bloody Kansas and the Missouri Compromise and uh, some things going on before that. So 30 years after that, we finally got propelled out of Kansas because of all of the upheaval that had been happening and uh, ended up in northeastern Oklahoma sharing some reserve land with the Peoria. Um, any questions on that? You know, we do have uh, some blog posts on this, um, and you know, I'm such a bad historian. I don't quite remember exactly, but they do, uh, if you go on our blog post, and I'm happy to share that with you, they go day by day what happened. And it was quite a long time, and a lot of people died along that uh, route. But you know, to the, for the life of me, I can't remember how many days it was. <laughs> yes, sir? So Fort Wayne is very close to Provin uh, Provin uh, Provincetown, where uh, the Comte was, uh, had his uh, base there. Is there any history in your, in your relation with the uh, uh, Shawnee and his alliance that he was establishing that has you have shown some uh, connection with uh, the Comte and, with the, and the Miami people? Yes, uh, indeed. Um, the Shawnee were considered um, our, our relatives, and we shared a lot of our uh, Ohio lands with them. Uh, we you know, overlapped with our hunting. Uh, as many of you all probably know, indigenous people didn't all just live in one conglomerate, you know, con conglomeration. There were multiple little villages all over the place because you had to live uh, in a way that the resources around you could support. And so we also traveled through that, uh, throughout the, the area. Um, and we did uh, interact very closely with the Shawnee. Um, when it comes to the actual relationship with Tecumseh, um, I believe that there, it, there was a division within our tribe about whether or not we you know, follow him or not. Um, but you know, I haven't delved too deeply into that particular aspect of it. But, you prompted me to look a little deeper. I know it was, it was div divisive, as it was the entire time. You have a lot of young folks coming up who wanted to pursue that kind of action uh, that, that Tecumseh was, was uh, promoting. And then you had some of the older folks who were saying, this is not working. We need to actually try more diplomatic um, pathways. So. My own history, this is uh, you know, my tribal history, which I think is really important because it does really influence my own identity. But my own history starts in an Indian hospital in Claremore, Oklahoma, which is about 90 miles from Miami. 
And I was born there, and then I was taken to the Mexico-Texas border by my parents, where I grew up in a small town called San Felipe del Rio. Um, then I went to UT Austin, and after that I went to Miami University, which sits on my tribe's original um, homelands, particularly our hunting homelands, and then made, made my way to Stony Brook. And I have to say, and anybody who knew me there during that time, and there are quite a few in here, um, I was totally overwhelmed by New York uh, and the people who were very, very nice and helpful, but not friendly in the way that a southerner uh, is friendly. And I know, I know uh, that I drove some people absolutely crazy with my chit chat and uh, with my naivete. So, um, but somehow I, I made it through and even made some really good friends and had many mentors along the way. Uh, some of which are, some of whom are here today, so thank you. And to these friends and mentors, I say mishinewe, or many, many thanks. As a proud graduate of Stony Brook with a PhD in history and a graduate certificate in women, gender, and sexuality studies, I'd like to say mishinewe, a big thanks for inviting me to present through the Sir Run Run Shaw Lecture Series. I am thrilled to be here with you all today. And as I mentioned, uh, I do hope that you ask questions along the way. Um, I also just want to put another little caveat out there before I dig into the, the content really today, um, is that there is a great diversity of thought in Indian country on all topics. Um, as such, I do not represent a unified voice in, from Indian country. I do not represent uh, a position held by the Miamia tribal government, nor do I represent the University of Texas system. I am not speaking for UT system. So today I'm going to be exploring indigenous invisibility, the co-opting and complexities of indigenous identity, as well as sharing some deeply pondered yet incomplete thoughts on where we are as institutions of various types of power, on where we should go from here as well. So please consider this as a work in progress. And while I don't speak for or represent the three entities that I've just named, again, all of Indian country, the Miami Nation of Oklahoma, nor the University of Texas system, my position has everything to do with them. And my remarks emerge from grappling with these institutions of power as I make my way through life, both professionally and personally. And I'm trying to raise a complex history that is impacted and integral to many institutions of power, higher ed, politics, economics. But ultimately, I'm going to be focusing on higher education's implication in this history. And that's primarily because that's my sphere of influence and it's also the one that I most want to change right now. As uh, Liz mentioned, in my role as Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the University of Texas System, I lead and support student success initiatives across our nine academic institutions. We have over 250,000 students at UT System. UT System uh, undergraduates bring to our institutions a rich tapestry of assets and experiences. They come from very diverse backgrounds. Approximately 40% across the system are Pell eligible, and the number is as high as 61.8% at one of our institutions. Approximately 60% are underrepresented minorities. 3% are other which includes American Indian or Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, as well as unknown or not reported. I have no idea how many indigenous students, faculty, or staff are at UT system institutions. All of these data, predictive analytic capacity even, and I still can't tell you how many indigenous folks figure into these figures? And UT system is not alone in this. When attending national higher education conferences, 
and I feel like maybe some of you are going to relate to this, discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion are frequently at the forefront. Plenary sessions with titles like Student Success, High Impact Practices for Diverse Students immediately catch my attention, prompting me to include them in my schedule. However, as I sit in the audience, I notice that the terms black, African American, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Hispanic are often mentioned, while Native American or indigenous students are rarely acknowledged or not acknowledged at all unless I'm the one doing it. Hi. I am a tribal citizen and an indigenous higher education administrator. These intersecting identities make me a rare breed. In 2021, according to the National Center for Educational Statistics, the percentage of American Indian Alaska Native faculty at a degree-seeking post-secondary institution was less than one half of one percent. The number of indigenous higher education administrators are not even tracked to my knowledge. And based off the faculty numbers, I would venture to say that I'm one of very few in the country, uh, particularly outside of tribal colleges and particularly at my level. As such, I do have a stake in this, both professionally and personally. But I think that everybody should care about this, and I don't think that people do really in any type of serious way. And I think that there are reasons for this. There are, is a lot of national discussion swirling around the topic of historically marginalized student populations in higher ed. Debates about critical race theory, and I put that in quotes, since the debate is not about the actual theory, nor about where it is or is not taught. Anti-DEI legislation, and most recently the Supreme Court ruling against race conscious admissions. Even with myriad headlines in national media outlets covering these discussions, not one has mentioned Native Americans unless it came from an indigenous media source. Sadly, this is nothing new. Native Americans remain absent from national discourse and national narratives. Though, this, though with Secretary Holland's elevation and efforts at the Department of the Interior, a modicum of attention has been given to some issues affecting Indian country, such as the missing and murdered indigenous women and some sacred lands. And that's just to name a couple. Still, with these issues popping up in the news, they rarely make headlines unless they are covered in indigenous-focused news media. These issues are one and done in the mainstream media. And the same holds true far too often in the education sector. As an indigenous uh, university system administrator, I've thought about these issues a great deal much of my thought being born out of frustration, as you might imagine. There is not a day that goes by that I am not looking at disaggregated data about our student populations. Unfortunately, that daily dose of data rarely includes Native Americans. In data sets, Native Americans are too often made invisible by consignment to the made-up status of other or simply represented by an asterisk. And that's a fact that other indigenous scholars have pointed out, so I'm not the first to, to do that. The asterisk in this case represents too small a number, but it conveys insignificance and omission. For example, the sample size might be 501, but the asterisk conveys or translates to no value. In the statistical world, the in has a value and a meaning. But in the representational world, one that is institutional in terms of the academy and political and economic domains, where the insidiousness of the non-valuing of indigenous people in this way <coughs> is so damaging.
because the represent representational world, <coughs> excuse me, leads and converts to action and non-action in these domains. That is why this matters. When natives are rendered invisible in the data, then resources are not specifically allocated to their support and success, and their needs are not truly investigated or addressed, resulting in a greater lack of understanding. The relegating of indigenous peoples to the status of a punctuation mark reflects the fact that indigenous people, our history, our challenges, our successes, our future, are absent in the national narrative itself. This representational absence or invisibility has enormous implications because it represents the absence of indigenous people in places of educational power, economic power, federal power, political power. In short, in the institutions and systems where power is held, fought over, and over the past 300 years have yielded very little of their power to historically marginalized people. I do think that this is changing gradually, too gradually. Though we were the first inhabitants of this land, today Native Americans are seemingly invisible and forgotten. The first humans to set foot on the North American continent approximately 20 to 30,000 years ago were the ancestors of modern day First Nations in Canada, Alaska Native, and Native Americans in the continental US. Native Americans and Alaska Natives constitute 2.9% of the total US population according to the 2020 US Census. Though this number represents an overall increase from 2010 to 2020, due to enhanced efforts at reporting design and process, as well as the increased self-reporting due to DNA tests, like 23andMe, and the highly contagious Cherokee grandmother syndrome. Girl. I know. Listen. I know. <laughs> so even through all of that, the 2020 figure is, is thought by some, including Brookings, to be uh, underestimated. Nevertheless, it is essential to recognize that within the United States alone, we represent more than 600 tribal nations, 175 languages, and 574 federally recognized tribes. These federally recognized tribes are sovereign nations with a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the US government. And there are many more that still operate as tribal communities, but have lost federal recognition through the treaty process and through federal termination policies, which, make no mistake, were federal attempts at erasure. The diversity among tribal communities was and is immense, each with their own traditions, customs, artistic aesthetics, uh, language groupings, life ways. This in, in and of itself is worth taking note of, of, of celebration even. Yet despite this wealth of cultural diversity and long history, indigenous people remain invisible and the sovereignty of their nations has been and continues to be undermined in myriad visible and not so visible ways. And when a group of people are rendered invisible in this country, their potential is limited. But why are we left out? Many critics argue that our popula population numbers are just too insignificant to make much of a difference in policy and program decisions. Even if, if, even if we were included. But I disagree. The argument put forth makes statistical sense. I understand math. I mean, sort of, right? I understand it makes statistical sense. But it does not make moral sense. The in is too small and would betray the Family Educational Rights and Protection Act, better known as FERPA, an important protection to be sure. The argument regarding small sample size, however, seems a little bit like a double whammy to me. 
First whammy, indigenous nations suffered from disease brought by European colonists and were warred upon, colonized, and assimilated by way of the American educational system. Second whammy, even after surviving all of that hardship, our small numbers, and for small numbers refer to first whammy, are the reason why we are frequently not in data sets and research questions. Presence in those data sets and research would lead to targeted student success interventions to help our students succeed in higher education and in the world today. Our absence means that there is a missed opportunity, not to mention neglect and a failure, or is it an abdication of responsibility? In other words, our lack of representation compounds our lack of representation. A tautology ensuring the small n becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that confers, allows, and even requires insignificance. And again, this has enormous educational, political, and economic consequences. How did we get here? The systemic erasure of indigenous people can be attributed to various factors, genocide among them, many of which are rooted in historical, systemic, and social barriers. Indigenous communities historically faced violent and administrative colonization, including suppression of indigenous language, cultural practices, and knowledge systems. This legacy has perpetuated a power imbalance that often excludes indigenous people from decision-making processes and policy discussions, particularly within education systems. Indigenous communities were, and continue to be, subjected to marginalization, discrimination, and socioeconomic disadvantage for generations. Challenges such as inadequate funding, limited access to culturally responsive academic support, a lack of indigenous-focused curricula, and insufficient indigenous represent representation among faculty and staff can hinder active participation by indigenous students in higher education. Invisibility in the foundational elements of education conveys to native students an unmistakable message that they do not belong in higher ed. So, indigenous students are not in the programs and policies because there aren't, they aren't represented in the data, because there aren't enough students, native students, making it to higher ed, and they aren't making it to or staying in higher ed because it fails at allowing them a sense of authentic belonging or sometimes even acknowledging them or their history. Too often, educational systems find it easier to ignore the realities and histories of indigenous people than to take appropriate steps to address those realities and histories. So there's a little bit of a contradiction here, though. So we are invisible, yet we are also in, um, imagined everywhere. Invisible, but we're imagined everywhere. Our invisibility in real life leads people to imagine who we are, resulting in harmful stereotypes that fail to capture the complexity of indigenous history and indigenous contemporary realities. As many indigenous people already know, if we're thought of at all, we are imagined more than we are understood in the broader American culture. When we are imagined, the representation of our communities is completely out of our hands, which can serve to intensify anti-indigenous structural racism. Our realities are denied, absent. I think most folks who have been paying attention would agree that mainstream American culture reduces indigenous peoples to the status of a stereotype. And I know we're not alone in that. Stereotypicals of, of Native Americans are ubiquitous, right? 
You can't walk into uh, a convenience store and not see natural, uh, um, natural uh, American spirits, natural American spirit cigarettes with the headdress wearing uh, chief logo. Thousands of schools, both high schools, colleges, and professional teams still have racist logos, mascots. But I will say that we're not just sitting back and letting all of this happen, right? Uh, indigenous people are finding very creative ways, not just to respond, but to actually create our own narratives that compete with these stereotypical images. Sign in to Netflix, Disney's Pocahontas pops up, or that weird Johnny Depp Tonto. Adam Sandler's Ridiculous Six, whose portrayal of native characters as simply the butt of jokes caused a bunch of them to walk off the set. But indigenous people have responded, again, by standing up to this representation, by writing, directing, producing, and acting in our own narratives. Res Dogs, how many people have seen that? It's hysterical. Yeah, I'm so sad the last season was just done. It's, it's over with, but that's OK. Dark Winds, also a little bit more controversial, but is, that's a great series. Um, so they've been doing their own writing and directing and acting in these, but they've also served as more uh, cultural consultants for things like um, The English. Have, has anybody seen that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I watch all of them, too. Um, the English, and then also The Killers of the Flower Moon, which I have not seen, but I did read the book. It was fantastic. So need some new clothes? Go into Urban Outfitters. You're going to see geometric patterns. And you will also see that uh, in this particular case, they actually used the name of a tribe, giving no, um, no compensation to tribes, no compensation to indigenous artists, even though they're banking. But again, you know, indigenous designers have responded to such appropriation by, um, and, and the sidelining that happens to them by collaborative efforts such as Swaya's Fashion Week, which if you haven't been, it's fantastic. The Indian Arts Festival in Santa Fe. And it was one day, but now they're actually going to have a whole week of Swaya. And you'll see indigenous designers all over the place. And also Canada has their version of the Indigenous Fashion Week. And they really um, they use their culture as inspiration for their designs. Some of it's ready to wear, and some of it's completely haute couture. You all probably also remember Quanah Chasing Horse from the Met Gala. She is um, not only a model, but she is also an environmental activist. And after she made headlines with her uh, appearance at the Met Gala, she's been using her newfound fame to promote indigenous uh, representations that are actually uh, much more accurate and also to promote uh, environmental um, uh, activism. So, you know, we're trying to reclaim our visibility on our own terms. Halloween just passed, and people have been dressing up in Indian costumes for ages, along with monsters, goblins, ghouls, and witches. Kindergarten uh, conjures up images of kids dressed up in paper Indian outfits with the vest and the, I mean, I remember wearing those when I was in kindergarten. But, I mean, this is, this is just off of Amazon. Like, I, I could have, there were thousands of images. But look at, looky here. I mean, you've got Pocahontas. This looks like basically the same exact outfit. And that came from Amazon, and so did this. I mean, exoticism, anyone? Yes. There were others where it was this, how. Um, and here I think about the Illuminative, um, the work of Illuminative, which is a Native woman-led racial and social justice organization dedicated to increasing the visibility of and challenging the narratives about Native peoples. 
And the founder of Illuminative, Crystal Echohawk, is Pawnee, and she served as the cultural consultant on the English. And it's actually been um, lauded for its appropriate um, depiction of Pawnee culture, even though the, the actor itself is not Pawnee. So stereotypes divorced from indigenous reality, in addition to being an obstacle for, for people understanding that reality, also uh, allows for harm in other ways. Stereotypes can be performed. The performing of things you think an Indian would do or look like, how they might talk, walk, what they might wear, how they might do their hair, all of this, particularly when generalized through stereotype, allows for imitation. It's a little harder to imitate a Miyamia or someone from the Jemez Pueblo or the Yurok Nation or any specific tribal community, at least for very long. This general category of Indian is much easier to mimic. And it happens all the time, and it has for a long time. And I put a little blame on that, on the urban relocation efforts that took people from specific tribes, put them into an urban area where nobody could then tell you know, what the, the specific culture of that tribe was. And instead, we have a pan-Indian identity, which in some ways did some good, but it also caused this, this general Indian category to become very prevalent. Yes? Can I make a, uh, a comment about sure. uh, relocation efforts uh, and representation? Because um, the Cherokee chief, Lola Mankiller, mm -hmm. um, her family, um, was part of those relocation efforts to California, and then she returned to Cherokee Nation to become uh, the first woman principal chief. And Barbie has just come out with a Wilma Mankiller doll. Oh, wow. As of a couple days ago. And um, I think it's interesting and complex. Apparently, according to the, the gossip on, on Facebook, um, Mattel didn't consult with her. Uh, living relatives about this. Oh. And I don't know if they spoke with people in Cherokee Nation or not. I, I don't know. Yes. But, um, but so now apparently there's a Wilma Mankiller doll. And I, you know, I think this is one of those cases where um, it's, a, it's a departure, right? And it's a representation. But there's also a kind of process that maybe wasn't followed that could have been followed. And so I think mm -hmm. there's growing pains that, that I'm sort of identifying as, as we also seek to have these, these other types of, of representations. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to have to yeah. look into that. That's very interesting. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? Yes. So I, I've been with you for most of the day. And I heard you talk about federally recognized tribes state recognized tribes and some tribes that are not recognized at all. Could you just talk about that process and mm. how <laughs> some tribes are federally recognized? And yes. I mean, I, I'm, you know, about to step in some pretty deep, muddy waters here, and I am by no means an expert on it, but um, I actually at one point uh, applied for a job with the uh, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs to do the, the Office of Federal Recognition. And so I, I looked up on it. Um, I mean, they were going to offer me a lot of money, and I was very excited about that because it was in the middle of the recession, and I was like, yes. And then I started looking more deeply into it and thinking about what that meant. Um, and, you know, what I found, as is not going to be any surprise to any of you all, is that uh, federal recognition, of course, is a deeply flawed system. Uh, even my tribe, we have the Miamas that are in Oklahoma are federally recognized, but we have a, a, a group of, of Miama, Miamas from Indiana that did not end up being removed, and they kept about 100 acre preserve there for the community to go back. Um, and But by doing that, they kind of supposedly gave up their citizenship in our tribe, uh, which is not 
a real thing, by the way. Um, like, that's not how that works. And, um, but, you know, after being removed and after having been away from the rest of our, our, our relatives for so long and being forced to create a uh, constitution that in many ways mimics the one of the United States, we had to then put uh, a, a, a boundaries around who would be considered a citizen of our tribe. And they, we don't do blood quantum, we do descendancy. And so we said, if you were removed to Oklahoma, then you are a part of our tribe. Only a few years ago did we open it up to those that were moved, removed to Kansas, because they were still removed. But the ones that stayed in Indiana, they're still not part of the federally recognized tribe. And part of that is to do with our tribe, and part of that has to do with the government not encouraging us to do that, right? Um, I believe blood is blood, culture is culture, and they're still our relatives. So when it comes to the, the deeply flawed thing, I read this really fascinating book on uh, federal recognition, and in it, it showed, it did a bunch of uh, calculations, you know, data, and looked at which tribes got federal recognition over time. And according to the book, um, if tribes intermarried with white people and ended up being lighter skinned, they were more likely to get federally recognized than those that intermarried with black people. And that has been my experience when talking to tribes, uh, especially I know the ones out here in Long Island and some other ones. And so it is, you know, it, again, it's, it's the federal government telling our sovereign nations who can or cannot be in our tribe and basing it off of things that I don't think are from our traditional worldviews. Sir, I know you wanted to say something. Well, I'm going to get you get it even more money. Uh-oh. Well, better you than me. So the uh, National Congress of American Indians, which only has a representation of 189 of the 574 that federally recognized of which 24 of them state recognized, has um, floated a uh, resolution in their upcoming uh, national con uh, conference that excludes membership to those state-recognized tribes, calling them social groups rather than sovereign nations. Oh. And I... Uh, Wanted to get your opinion on that because I think I think I have it, but I want you to help me with it because if they're fo that seems to me that what you said is that they're following the the, the uh, federal government's process of alienation of, of nations by the removal process, by extermination process, by the lack of recognition of those nations who may have. Uh, mixed blood with other than white people, and they uh, are we, we, and stayed in their in their Aboriginal territory mm -hmm. and didn't get removed, mm -hmm. but are being punished for that resiliency and that determination mm -hmm. to withstand the onslaught of, uh, of European contact. Are they following the? the policies of degradation by the federal government, because they're saying it's protecting their sovereignty. Right. But Man. Opinion, it is really hurting their sovereignty. You just really, you're just not throwing me any curve, like any softballs. You're throwing me curveballs. But I mean, I'll tell you what I think. Again, I am not an expert in this at all, but I do have thoughts on all of these things here. Um, I think there are some real tribal communities that are truly what you're talking about. And then I think there are a lot of tribal groups that are completely make-believe. And I think that the challenge is figuring out which ones are which. Um, but as I'm gonna talk about in, in just a little bit, you know, who gets to determine who has authentic identity or not? And I think that that's a really, uh, that, that is a challenge. But I think that's why some tribal nations don't want, you know, like, 
there are people who are related in our tribe, um, who are related to Indiana Miamas, who are like, they can never be part of our tribe, right? I don't quite understand that mentality, but the, it's a, there was a lot of trauma that went along with that, um, that, that are from the Indiana Miamas and the, and the Oklahoma Miamas. Um, I think that, just lost my train of thought. Um, where was I? Who should make that determination? Oh, yeah. Who should make that determination? I, you know, I think that what it comes down to is a lot of tribal nations see that we're already competing over resources. And so people are, are, um, are a little guarded about that. But I also think that there is a proliferation of a lot of fake Indians out there. And I think that the, the real tribal communities who are struggling for some of that, um, that state recognition or that, that federal recognition are suffering because of these other tribal groups. And I've seen some on, on uh, the internet uh, that I was going to share up here, but some of them are just wacky. Like totally, you don't understand where they're coming from. So I'm probably not answering your question, but you know, we are living under systems that we didn't create, and now we're beholden to those systems in some way for us to maintain our sovereign nation status. Um, it's almost like we have to play the game that someone else made up the rules for. And I think that that's challenging, um, but we do it because we get a lot of benefit to try to help our people revitalize our language, revitalize our culture, and that's why we do it, and I think that we're kind of beholden to that. There's a, there's a golden handcuff in that respect. I know I didn't answer your question entirely, but that's the best I can do for now. We can maybe talk privately later. <laughs> Thank you. Well, getting back to this idea of um, imitation, and I know that I've only got like 30 minutes left. Boy, time flies. How many of you all remember The Crying Indian? I remember sitting in front of my TV set in the 70s watching The Crying Indian, who was um, you know, a, a, an actor who was um, kind of the face, or I say the tear here, of the environmental movement. And you would see him in a buckskin shirt and feathers, and sometimes he was on a horse, and sometimes he was in a canoe paddling down a river and surveying the land like this, and seeing the grime and the pollution and all of that, and then the, the camera zooms in on his face, and you see this look of desperation, and then it zooms in even closer, and you see this little tear running down his dark, chiseled face. He became a, the face of the Keep America Beautiful campaign, and it was a powerful ad if your goal was to clean up the environment. But it wasn't so great when you learned that the man in the commercial, and who was in a lot of different um, Hollywood movies, was actually a, a man who called himself Iron Eyes Cody, was not even Native American at all. He was Italian. But he portrayed himself to be native both on and off the screen. And he looked the part. I mean, here he is. He made a, 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 a headdress for Jimmy Carter. He looked the part, meaning he looked and dressed just as a mainstream society thought a native man should look and dress. He imitated affectations and signifiers that, would other, uh, that others would easily recognize as stereotypically Indian. But though he fit the stereotype, he was not part of any tribal community. He was not native at all, imagined, not understood, pretend. He was playing Indian. Philip Deloria reminds us in his book, Playing Indian, that people have been playing dress up uh, and imitating Indians since the very beginning of the American Revolution, if not before. And that playing Indian is never as simple as it seems and that every instance of imitation must be analyzed within the political and social context of its time and place. In other words, 
In the American Revolution, dressing up like an Indian symbolized rebellion and separateness from Great Britain. That's not what the crying Indian was doing. He was not trying to be rebellious or separate from Britain, right? And this 1970s crying Indian was more, so, uh, more closely symbolizing um, indigenous spirituality and closeness with the land, uh, a sacred relationship of sorts that was really big during that time. Uh, and we all know from the New Age movements of the time. But why is playing Indian so dangerous? When a group of people are rendered invisible, this existential absence creates opportunities for people to commit indigenous identity fraud, which serves to reinforce anti-indigenous structural racism. These pretendians can be found in all sectors, clearly, and I've just heard about Buffy St. Marie, but I think the jury's out on that one. I haven't read up on it yet. Um, so they're, they're in all sectors, but they're becoming increasingly common in the academy, causing substantial harm and raising critical questions around the validation of one's identity. So let's start with some terms. Okay, pretendian, what do I mean by that? Well, you may also hear the phrases playing Indian, race shifter, pseudo-Indian, indigenous identity fraud, or racial identity theft. When I use the word pretendian, I'm specifically talking about non-indigenous people who falsely claim indigenous ancestry and identity and represent themselves as such for personal or professional gain. But all of these phrases apply as well. And this is not just um, exclusive to Indian pretenders, right? I mean, we all remember Rachel Dolezal, Jessica Krug, and H.G. Uh, Carrillo, the, the novelist and academic who falsely claimed to be uh, Afro-Cuban. And the list goes on and on, sadly. But I want to make clear here, too, that there are many different ways to exist and experience life as an indigenous person and different ways to conceptualize one's identity as an indigenous person. I mean, even if you put 10 Indians in a room together, we're all going to look different. We're coming from different backgrounds, have different family backgrounds. Everyone has a unique journey to and through one's identity as, a, as an indigenous person. And that journey is heavily influenced by dominant institutions and by history, by past experiences outside of one's control. The matter is complicated by the shared history of forced removals and forced uh, assimilation, the internalized racism or the hiding of one's indigenous identity even from family as a survival strategy, and finally, the separation of children from their families being placed in non-indigenous households in non-indigenous communities far away from their homelands. All of these experiences and more have caused family lineages to break or become obscured, thereby creating situations where some people don't discover the indigenous family connections until later in life. These tragedies happened uh, to too many indigenous families and are still happening today. And interestingly, I was in the elevator today wearing a Miami shirt, Miami University shirt, um, or t a sweatshirt, going down to get coffee first thing this morning. And somebody in the elevator says, hey, is that Miami of Ohio? I'm like, yes, it is. And he goes, hey, well, you know, I've got, um, I'm part Miami. We just found out, and we are working with the tribe to research our family connection. I was like, no way. I'm Miami. <laughs> And so we, of course, was stalling the elevator, had to get out, and we spent a 20-minute conversation, and we're going to do a Zoom call later on uh, this week. And in this particular case, his great-grandmother had been um, adopted out of the tribe, and they only kind of discovered it not that long ago. And so he's doing it the appropriate way by going through our cultural resources office uh, in our archivist to try to document the actual history and uh, uh, removal of his particular ancestor. But that's really crazy. And it was like I had found a long lost relative. And truth be told, we could be related, right? <laughs> so, and then we have the Cherokee princess grandmother syndrome, which I've personally heard at least 20 times in my lifetime from people who really do believe it. 
Indigenous intellectual Vine Deloria Jr. and Custer died for your sins, an Indian manifesto written in 16, uh, 1692, 1969, just a couple years before I was born. He wrote it during his time, um, during uh, the, his time as executive director of the National Congress of American Indians. He wrote, it was a rare day when some white didn't visit my office and proudly pro proclaim that they were of Indian descent. Cherokee was always the most popular tribe of choice, and all but one person he met who claimed Indian blood claimed it on his grandmother's side, claimed it on their grandmother's side. He went on to say, quote, I once did a projection backwards and discovered that evidently most tribes were entirely female for the first 300 years of occupation. No one, it seemed, wanted to claim a male Indian forebearer. And perhaps the male Indian, um, he posits, was too savage a warrior for most people's tastes. Oh, and the other thing, most of these Cherokee grandmothers was an Indian princess despite the fact that, that the tribe, and probably most every tribe, never had a social system with anything resembling an inherited aristocracy. Yes. Oh, and I'm so thankful for that. Or, more recently, claiming to be indigenous because of a DNA test. Sounds cliche, and it is, but it is true, and I also get a lot of people telling me that. Happens all the time. And I don't think that these folks are being malicious or setting out to usurp indigenous identity for some nefarious purpose. I think they're genuinely interested or excited about the prospect of being native. Sometimes people are legitimately reclaiming their indigenous identities, like my friend Clayton on the elevator. And some are simply claiming without any legitimate tie at all. Either way, in these cases, one cannot assume that just because they have some tie to an indigenous ancestor, that they can represent an indigenous worldview or can represent indigenous communities. It doesn't work that way. You aren't magically indigenous, the indig indigeneity sleeping in the very molecules that make up your DNA, and that when you receive that email with your ethnicity and racial disaggregation, a signal is sent to those molecules to wake up that indigenous way of knowing and being, and that the ancestors start visiting you through your dreams, telling you the stories of hardship and of community, and of the stories which teach us about who we are as indigenous people and you suddenly know how to play lacrosse and moccasini, the moccasin game. In other words, just because you suddenly discover that you have an indigenous family member in your past, or think that you maybe, probably, hopefully do, doesn't automatically mean that you embody indigeneity or can speak from lived experience as a member of a dispossessed, marginalized, often oppressed group of people. Maybe Indians need their own name, image, and likeness contract, NIL. It would be a game changer. Why do some people take on an identity that is not their own? The University of Texas anthropologist and Mississippi Choctaw descendant, Circe Sturm, wrote a book about a group of white folks who she says race shift and it's called Becoming Indian, the Struggle Over Cherokee Identity in the 21st Century. In it, she discusses the over 200 self-identified Cherokee organizations, even though they are only, there are only three recognized Cherokee tribes. Sturm posits that these race shifters understood their whiteness as, quote, guilt, loneliness, isolation, and a gnawing sense of racial, spiritual, and cultural emptiness. In their search to fill that emptiness, they focused on their actual or perceived tenuous Cherokee ancestral line as informing the totality of their identity. 
We all might relate to some aspect of this longing, guilt, or emptiness, but taking on an identity means taking on their history, their lived experience, and the trauma of that community and making it yours. Pretendians are problematic for so many reasons. First, when someone fraudulently proclaims themselves to be native, they perpetuate a destructive myth that native identity is determined by the individual, not the tribe or community, which undermines tribal sovereignty and native self-determination. And it's a departure from, in, from indigenous relational notions of identity. And pretendians cause real harm. As Cherokee journalist Rebecca Nagel, also queer, points out, Quote, in a country with a long history of turning harmful myths about native identity into public policy, such as blood quantum, the popular and false validity of DNA testing and family lore is deeply troubling. The danger of today's rhetoric is the possibility that it becomes tomorrow's policy. So let's take the case of the pretendians in the academy. You may have heard of some of these cases like Ward Churchill, Elizabeth Hoover, and Andrea Smith. And these are just three examples, but there are a whole lot more. Andrea Smith was a former colleague. Actually, it's not even former. She's still there. Her separation agreement goes until August of 2024, although she's not on campus very often um, and is teaching two, uh, from what I hear, under-enrolled uh, queer classes. Um, but she's still at UC Riverside, and um, she's a colleague of a, a Miami scholar and relative of mine, uh, Dr. Wesley Leonard. And I remember reading her book in graduate school. It was Conquest, Sexual Violence and American Indian Genocide, and it sits on my bookshelf at home. And I picked it up the other day and thought about the issue of pretendians and the implication of their scholarship purportedly from the perspective of an indigenous scholar and indigenous lived experience. In other words, the implication of their academic fraud. Now, my boss at UT System is a um, comparative lit person. She goes, well, but, you know, you should take text as text. And I was like, uh, when you're writing from this particular perspective, um, it, feels, it feels dirty. It feels fraudulent. It feels like academic dishonesty. She didn't disagree, just for the record. Indigenous scholars have enumerated the harm of this kind of fraud to indigenous people, which is significant and includes misappropri uh, misappropriation of resources, earmarked for indigenous students and researchers, promotion of uh, harmful stereotypes about ind indigeneity by those with li without lived experience as well, um, and when someone claims an identity, students and colleagues expect that they are bringing experiential knowledge into their teaching and research, that they have lived indigenous experiences and knowledge that provide a unique perspective and understanding, right? It's in this that many feel is the most heinous harm done in indigenous identity fraud, the stealing of our experiences that we've lived through and those that our ancestors have lived through, claiming them as their own from some sort of professional or personal gain. Kim Talbear, citizen of the Sisseton Wapaton Oyate tribe in present day South Dakota, an expert in how uh, genetic sciences co constituted with notions of race and indigeneity, believes that race shifting is the final act of appropriation. And she points out that when pretendians rise through the professional ranks, falsely representing our voices, they're seen as thought leaders, institutional decision makers, and sometimes they become policy advisors to governmental leaders with regulatory and economic people, uh, power over our peoples and lands. And one of the reasons why she says that is that they seem a little bit more familiar to these non-indigenous leaders than people who are coming from the indigenous communities. Speak the same language. That's right. That's right. Yes. Um, I 
think I hope this will be the last time I want to make a, a comment. I, I was actually asked to write a letter for the case of uh, Andrea Smith's fraud investigation mm -hmm. at UC Riverside, and I was not happy to do so, but I, I did that. And um, there were a few other you know, Cherokee people who were asked to, to document the the harm, and I think it's really important how you're how you're naming the concrete ways in which pretendians create um, epistemic mm -hmm. harm by by shifting the way we understand things. Um, and one of the things that came out of other people's uh, testimony in in that UC Riverside case is that um, Smith has consistently marginalized um, Native women scholars around her. So it's not just hmm. taking uh, an identity as an individual, but it's, but it's yeah. individualizing yourself within and insulating yourself from other Native people within the academy so as to preserve that, that space. Um, and, and then, you know, people like us get asked to comment on it, like Kim Tolbert, like mm -hmm. Circe, um, on all these things. And it's just like another thing that we got to do to right. point out the day pretendians. And it's right. like, I got other things I want to be doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Rather than being a police officer, you know? right? Yeah. But an identity police. And, and the final, the, and, you know, Andrea Smith specifically identified as a Cherokee woman when she solicited interviews with victims of sexual abuse, sexual assault, by claiming that she was a Cherokee woman, a Cherokee woman who had a similar experience, mm -hmm. she effectively denied the people who she was interviewing yeah. the capacity of consenting to participate right. in her research. So it's not it's not a, a theoretical or a methodological question. There are actual like you know um, ethical breaches that happen when when these people. Um, pretend to be something they're not. Absolutely. It allow us to consent to participate in the same way that someone who's from your community would, would allow you to. Absolutely. And Andrew Smith also wrote stuff for the UN, for the World Bank. I mean, like, it's, it's all kinds of, like, it's everywhere. Anyways. No, no, I... I rant over. Well, no, no, and you actually are talking a little bit about some of the things that I'm going to point to, um, but you, you did it so much more eloquently than I would. Um, that's okay, we couldn't hear him anyway. So oh, no, okay, okay. Well, so, so yeah, there, there's that kind of harm that happens, but there's also harm that's done to, to uh, indigenous students, yep. right? So I already mentioned the lack of visibility of indigenous people on college campuses. So imagine, I really want you to put yourself in, in this position. Imagine you are an indigenous student and finally find an indigenous faculty member who you believe you can relate to, who might understand your experiences better than others, and who maybe even become an auntie or uncle to you, who watches out for you on campus. You take their classes, become their grad students, or even co-publish with them. Fast forward to the unveiling of the fraud. You may become disillusioned, embarrassed, traumatized by the fact that you trusted this individual. A challenge for you, uh, a challenging thing for you to do in a place that you are already uncertain of, that you, you have a complex history with, you know, in terms of our, our community, but you do. And now you're questioning your own judgment and feel that maybe, just maybe, that imposter syndrome you were already feeling is right that you really don't belong in higher ed. Pretendians are not harmful only to indigenous students, or um, they're also harmful to non-indigenous students and to Native American indigenous studies programs. It is not overstating the case to say that having a pretendian in your department can completely um, implode your program. There have been cases that show that if you have a, a pretendian in your, in your NACE program, folks have lost students, both indigenous and non-indigenous. They've lost colleagues. They've lost funding. 
And then you also find that indigenous students are not, uh, no longer applying to your graduate programs and you cannot recruit new faculty. They've lost some measure of legitimacy and it is really hard to get that back. Yes, sir. Isn't that a lot to do with the isolation of the institutions themselves and that they do not communicate with the, the, the every institution has both the native communities mm -hmm. surrounding it. And because of their isolationism and their better than thou attitude, they have a better understanding of what the professional uh, um, teacher is supposed to look like. I mean, you could walk into a native community in any way, shape, or form, and a person presents themselves. I mean, when we teach ourselves a language, the first thing we teach is, who am I? Mm -hmm. What is my name? Where do I come from? What is my clan? That's right. And who are my people? That's right. That's how we introduce ourselves. And yep. if anybody comes into that environment and doesn't have that understanding, we know right away that this is a suspicious individual. Right. We don't care about those who have credentials. We care about those who have credentials and use a, a certain identity in order to bust their uh, promote their attractiveness to the institution. And it is the isolation of the institution that doesn't connect to an Indian community who has that cultural understanding that allows that to continue. And I present that, I present that to you because we're about to create one of those things. Mm -hmm. Right. And to not have a connection to the local community is of course not going to be permitted, but it is essential. It is essential to a successful beginning of a program. Integrity. Right. And it's integrity. I, I cre helped create the Dartmouth Native program. Oh, I didn't know that. And when that happened, we hired Michael Doris. The students hired Michael Doris to begin the Native Studies program in that, in that uh, status. And he took the ball and ran with it and made him one of the better undergraduate programs in the country. But then they got away from the local community and hired people from, uh, you know, uh, far out west. When that's and so the, now the yep. next thing you hear about this, a pretendian is running a program. And I'm like, how could that possibly happen? It happens because they get isolated. Right. That's my take on it. I don't, I don't disagree with you in some respects. I don't think there are enough indigenous, I mean, we, we're, we're coming up against the, the, the realities of being in a university system, right? I mean, I have a PhD, which gives me a card. That gives me some measure of legitimacy with other a academics, whether it's, it's, you know, right or not, right? Um, and that tells other folks that, you know, I went through this process in order to get a PhD. And we don't have enough indigenous folks doing that. And some people would say, well, maybe, you know, why do they have to? But you're still working within a university structure. And so, like, you have to have that in order to be in certain roles. And right or wrong, that's how it is. And I think that's why they're hiring people from, you know, out west. And if, if somebody comes to me and says that they are, you know, Nakota, I don't know enough about the Nakota nation to understand whether or not they're being culturally appropriate as a Nakota. Um, but then the question becomes, who gets to determine who's an authentic indigenous person or not? Right? Are we going to leave it up to the universities to decide? That makes me a little nervous. But then are we going to leave it to the faculty to try to police what that identity is? Are you going to go talk to the tribal communities of all of the applicants? Like, it, I, it, I don't have an answer for it. I know it's a problem. Um, but I do know that for, for me, you know, well, I will say, I think that universities and other institutions take identity as a personal identity category. And I do think that that's, you know, um, I think sometimes a personal identity category, category makes sense, like gender, for example. 
Um, but when it comes to indigenous identity, I, I don't think that that's right, right? Because there's this assumption in me that if I claim myself to be Miami, that my community is also claiming me, right? I think that having a personal identity category as an indigenous person is, um, it's a settler colonial perspective, right? It's one that where they're privileging the individual over uh, an, a community perspective, and it's, it's very harmful. So Kim Tallbear actually has a problem with the concept of identity in, in general. She says it's an English word, word that, that carries with it the, the implication that identity is inherently individualistic. Um, and she says we need to change the term. We need to be using a different term like relatives, relations, citizenship, kinship. Um, and that's a, a foreign way for, for folks to think, right? I don't have any definitive answers. I just have some, some thoughts. And I know that we're really running out of time here. So I kind of want to go through this really quickly. But it's really hard to figure out, even in my own self, um, you know, what is, what is Mia Mia and what is everything else? It's, there's a lot of cultural noise. And every day I learn that certain things about me or the way I do things is actually something that's very specific to my tribe that I didn't know, that an elder tells me or that I see somebody else doing. I'm like, whoa, I thought that was just something we did. So it's hard to, to, to sort all of that out. Identity for a Miami person and for I think most other indigenous people really is relational. Indigenous folks are individuals, but part of their identity as indigenous peoples is given life through their relationships with other people of their community and their relationship to the land, I would argue. In my case, as a Miamia, I am defined in part in relation to other Miamias and the Miamia community as a whole. Identity as a Miamia is collectively held. It is not possessed by one person. I bring something unique to that identity, and you know, we have always supported uniqueness and individuality within our tribal communities. But that uniqueness has no meaning as a Miamia until it's put into the context of the whole. So there is a creation and connection that happens within the nexus of my Miamia identity. So I, it's, it's, a very, it's a very complex situation, and I think that it's very messy. And again, I don't have any answers. But uh, I do want to kind of move a little bit forward since I think 5.30 was my end time, right? <laughs> Sorry. Well, let me just get to this, OK? I was going to tell you a little about the Tribal Center, but um, I would like to tell you what I want higher ed to do, because I think this is important. OK. I think that indigenous uh, in institutions need to hire more indigenous faculty, period. We need to specifically recruit and support in culturally appropriate ways. That's both for students and for in indigenous folks. We need to uh, um, recruit more indigenous undergrads and graduate students and then support them in culturally appropriate ways once they're on campus. Administrators, are there any administrators in here? OK, well, I'm an administrator. Um, and, and I try to live by this. When administrators go to fund indigenous programs, we need to be asking the program, what do you need and what do you want? Don't tell them what their funding is for or what you want them to do with that money. And that happens way too often. University leaders need to recognize that community-engaged scholarship with tribes is scholarship. It's not just service. And it needs to figure into tenure and promotion. Work with indigenous community members, faculty and staff, and students and allies 
to create a collaborative land acknowledgement. And a lot of people think land acknowledgements don't really matter, but as somebody who um, is worried that, that that right might be taken away from us, I understand what it means to the community in that respect. And it is powerful. And also, if you want to be able to institutionalize and normalize, you have to take a step somewhere. And I believe, as an, as an administrator in a very large system, that having land acknowledgments is one step closer to that institutionalization. You can't stop there, right? You have to, there has to be more in, uh, to it. But I do think it's a first step. Correct. Correct. To indigenous students who um, plan on doing research, which I don't know if there are any in here, but I'm just going to leave it for posterity. Seek out the work of indigenous researchers who approach research as medicine, as weaving a story rug, infusing research methodologies with indigenous ethos. Those indigenous scholars who are upending academic norms and repositioning them from an indigenous perspective, seek them out. And to those indigenous graduate students, and some of our departmental friends might not appreciate this comment, but I'm sorry, to those indigenous graduate students who are wondering about their path after graduating from their doctoral programs, consider a career in administration. And the reason why I say that is because we need indigenous people and indigenous allies at the, the top decision-making tables because that is where policies are made or not made. That's where funding decisions are made. And we need people who already understand and already believe that this work is valuable. And when I look around, I am the only one at the table. And I am not at the most important tables. So in closing, <laughs> Our story, the indigenous story, is a story of resistance. It's not one of us trying to become fully included in the sense that we become indistinguishable from everyone around us. Our story is one of distinction, maintaining our distinct cultural, spiritual, political identity, resistance to assimilation, resistance to obliteration. I said that with a lot of feeling and commitment to a good friend of mine Dr. Uh, Luis Carcamo Huechante, who is associate professor um, at UT Austin and director of the Native American Indigenous Studies program there, and he said, no. He's like, no, it's not about resistance, Nicole, or at least not, not all of it. He said it's actually more about persistence and permanence than resistance, uh, than, yeah, than resistance. He said our story is about keeping what we've achieved and particularly in higher ed, our programs, our funding, our initiatives. We must keep all of this alive and enduring amidst continuing attempts at dismantling our progress through racist policies, and sometimes just bad policy, which racist policies are bad policy, but there are some bad policy that's not particularly racist, just bad, through funding cuts and through political catastrophe wrought by state and federal legislative bodies. So I want to thank you all for, for being here today. And I just want to leave you with one final thought, is that we are, have been, and will always be more than an asterisk. Aho. Mishinewe. Thank you. Mission, really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. For us, it means big thanks. Mishi yeah. means big, Newe means yeah. thanks, yes. Yes. So, yes. Can I, I'll, briefly, I just want to add, you were talking about administration and the, the desirability of moving into administration. I, once again, briefly, come from a poor family headed by a woman who was a working class person who made baby hats. In a, uh, and what I didn't learn 
And what it seems to me that you have learned, given your position and your success at it, is how is administration. When it used to be traditional in my department for the full professors to take a turn in chairing the department, I said, <clears throat> excuse me, I said no because I'd ruin the department, <laughs> which is true. And I never, I don't have those skills. And, and there are other instances of this sort of thing that I just said no. I don't want to wreck this or that. Thank you. And is there something in your background that gave you the skills to go into administration? Because you're not born with them. I mean, I did okay at Stony Brook. I was a full <laughs> professor, et cetera, et cetera. But I never, I never wanted to. I, what about you? So uh, Chris asked, asked me this question earlier. Um, I think it was Chris, didn't you ask me this question? And you know, when I was here getting my PhD, I actually did think that maybe, I mean, I had intended on being a history professor. I mean, I love history. Um, I'm really fun at cocktail parties, because um, I do talk about that a lot. Um, but I also, in the back of my head, thought, you know, I would like to move into administration at some point. And partly, I think the reason why I'm here is I see a problem and then I've got to fix it. And I want to take all the skills that I've learned. I, you know, you have to be politically astute, which I'm still working on. And you, you navigate to get yourself into a place where you can then leverage your, your privilege and your position and the trust placed in you to be able to come to bear on those problems. And it's not that I know all of the answers to those problems. I don't know the solutions, but I always know how to bring people together and facilitate you know, groups of really brilliant people. When you put your minds together, you figure out what that solution is, and then I am the engine that tries to keep moving us towards that solution. And I'm good like that. And I don't know where that came from, but I, I think that it's just that I'm super mission-driven, and I, I, maybe I'm just a little obsessive. I don't know. <laughs> But, I mean, it is, it is what I do, and I don't think it's for everybody. Um, but I also think that too many folks, and I understand, I mean, I miss being in the archives. I miss researching and writing, so when I had an opportunity to come here, you know, I, I got to do a lot of thinking about things very deeply, and, and that was really great. I loved it. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, when I saw that there were big problems that I felt like I could come to bear, um, that I, I had to do that. I had to do that. My research will wait, and I had to, I had to do this here. And I think that there are probably going to be other folks, especially if they can't find jobs um, on the, on, in the market. And you asked me where my skills came from. It came from my graduate program. I use the skills all the time that I learned in my graduate program. I have just redeployed them in different ways, right? And actually, Stony Brook in, um, did an interview with me about that. And I, I say that in there. I'm like, I learned how to synthesize large amounts of information, you know, create arguments, like all of the things. I use that all the time. I just now deploy it in a different, a different way. So. Yeah, I learned how to read manuscripts. <laughs> well. This question is not a challenge. Oh, no, no. It's OK. Bring it. <laughs> you were here. Because you said you were here, I uh, think you said 2015? Well, I was here 2000 to 2005. 2005. Yeah. Okay. So we were just getting started with that program. Now. So I was just curious. When you were here, did you reach out at all to any members of the local community? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that question. So, yes, I planted him. Um, no, when I was here, I actually got um, a presidential challenge grant and a presidential uh, diversity grant along with my colleague, Tamfer Emman Tunch from the History Department. And we uh, put together an Indigenous Peoples Symposium. And so I did reach out to the, to the Shinnecocks in particular and uh, invited them. And I invited, I tried to reach out to whomever I could find. Granted, you know, I was young and a little naive and not always aware of all the political intricacies. Um, 
But I did reach out, and then we actually invited um, the, the Shinnecocks to come and do uh, an alternative Thanksgiving at the Women's Studies Department, and we provided them with an honorarium and all of that. Uh, I did not know about your tribal community at all. Um, in fact, I'm just learning of it, and I'm going to learn more about it. But I did try to bring folks in, and I brought in folks, uh, indigenous folks from in, in, in New York, and also from my tribe, and it, we were celebrating the, the UN's decade on indigenous peoples, and I tried. I tried to, to, to create some sort of community. We did have a student organization creating indigenous awareness here, and I, I, was, I participated with them, and I know that there were folks who were in that group that were from the local tribal communities, and so they participated in some of that, but, you know. It was the year after you left, 2006, when we signed a memorandum of understanding with the president of the university at that time, which was Shirley Strom Kinney. I remember her. It was an indigenous, created an indigenous people's, Native people scholarship, we call indigenous back in 2006. Native American people scholarship fund and a, uh, and a uh, MOU of understanding of, uh, of a, a, a Native community and university um, collaboration that you listed on your, uh, mm -hmm. in your, in your, in your board. Yet. I checked off all of the points. By oh, the yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't get to talk about the University Tribe Partnerships yeah, uh, like I wanted to, but check, 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 it, check. Is, it is critical. The Miamia Center is a tribally driven research center that's focused on language, culture, and history. And it is completely, like the university does not like have an impact on what, they, what we study there. But it did provide um, a space, and it provided some back office help, and it also provided some student scholarships. And I believe, since universities partner with corporations all the time, a lot because of money and jobs and all those kinds of things, but we should also be partnering with tribes in much more, in much more uh, deep ways. Yeah. I'm from Canada. Uh, Manitoba specifically, and uh, I've been involved in some, I'm, I'm a retired uh, professor, uh, and I'm still serving on some committees here and there, but uh, currently Canada has had some very high profile for, for 10 years. Yes. Uh, Carrie Barasa, um, recently uh, Ellen, uh, uh, Mary Andrew Pala, who's a lawyer, both of them mm -hmm. with really high profile positions in the academy in Canada. Um, Carrie Brassa served on uh, like a, a federal health uh, board and making, you know, in positions to make uh, very, you know, in very powerful positions to make decisions that are impacting on the lives of people in, in uh, tribal yeah. communities in Canada. And the uh, um, University of Saskatchewan did a they had they did a study that's actually very well done. You can find it online, but talking about uh, pretendianism and uh, the impact on the academy and some recommendations for what the academy needs. I think to I do. read so, that. And quite a few universities in Canada now are forming mm -hmm. um, committees. committees to uh, devise policy that the university will follow mm -hmm. on how to ensure in their hiring processes, mm -hmm. in their grant funding, in their student recruitment and selection processes or any kind of awards that they that they are uh, they have a process to ensure that the individual who's receiving that award if that was something that was speci specifically targeted to improve the lives of aboriginal people uh, and i prefer to use the word term aboriginal rather than indigenous because i think indigenous is a term that is also diminishing our sovereignty and the mm. way that it's used against us and to describe us, but um, though I, I think it's really important that universities actually formulate those advisory bodies that inform policy and mm -hmm. direction and, and uh, practice for you know administrative processes that the university can follow to ensure that when they have those when they do hiring that there's a some checks and balances in place to ensure that who they are hiring to represent mm -hmm. and speak on behalf of and for right. uh, indigenous people and indigenous knowledges are actually Aboriginal people. I still, you know, I use the term indigenous as well, but I find well, it problematic. Well, in yeah. I find all of the terms to describe us outside of our, our specific tribal designation problematic. 
I mean, Every to be quite honest. Yep. Yep. Yeah, well, I appreciate so those the remarks. Yep. Yeah. But thank you. Those, uh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, I went over a little bit. Yep. Nicole, I just want to say I really appreciate what you said at the beginning about who you, you know, who you speak for, and I think that's you know all the academic fraud going on, the problem with the Indigenous Studies program. That. That's where we need to start. I mean, who, who do you really speak from? And I've been in indigenous studies program where uh, the equivalent of Andrea Smith, mm -hmm. or they're speaking for you know all of indigenous population or all of the nations they pretend to be in. And even members that are official members of certain tribes don't have the right, right. to speak for that tribe. Yep. Um, and so that, that was very powerful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yep. I try to be very mindful about that. Well, it's just the honesty, you know, starting with the, the issue. I mean, that's, that's where I'll get. And there's so much dishonesty. Um, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I think the. Uh, topic of assimilation is a very, it's good that you brought it up because uh, personally speaking for me, my dad's Apache, but he was adopted by a white family. So the question of am I, how Indian am I, is kind of a question that I mm -hmm. readily have to, I guess, grapple with. And I think what you said about uh, personal experiences and uh, like also what you said, knowing who you're talking for it are important points when it comes to that discussion. I, yeah, thank you. I, and I also think that, you know, our histories have created a lot of folks who have become detached from their indigenous identity. And I don't think that that means that just because you, because circumstances have taken you away from that tribal community that you can't then go back to that tribal community and you know, learn from it and become part of it and ask questions. And I just think that, you know, folks want to skip that relationship piece. They're like, oh, you know, I'm Apache or I'm Miami. Well, you know, then I am Miami and everything I say is about, about being Miami. And I think that, you know, there's an opportunity there. Like you go back to the tribal functions. You you know, spend your time getting to know the elders, you, you spend your time learning the language, you, you do all of these things, and at some point when the community claims you, then you say, you know, I'm Apache. And it doesn't mean you're not Apache now, it means that you're not part of that community, right? I mean, I don't know you for, for, for a particular, but I just mean in general. Um, but I also don't want folks to be like, well, you know, I had a horrible trauma happen in my family and they were taken away from our tribal community. Oh, sorry. No, but you have to go and build those relationships. And I'm still building them. You know, I always try to go with a, I approach it with humility and I try to learn first and speak last. So, yep. thank you. All right, well, thank you all so very much, Mishinewe. <laughs>